Hello and welcome. This is a video from the GUS Research Training Unit. Today we're going to be talking about research ethics and specifically the basic concepts of research ethics that you want to keep in mind for any research design. The core principles that we'll talk about in this video are the concept of protection from harm, harm to participants in particular, but also harm to the researcher, possible harm to other people from the research that you're conducting. Uh, informed consent, this is a concept that applies to participants, so they're right, generally speaking, to know what the research is about and their rights as participants in the research process. Control over personal information. You'll more often see this described as a right to privacy, but there are reasons I think it's better described as the participant's control over their own personal information, and we'll talk about that. And the concept of justice and how that intersects with research ethics. Uh, research is something that tends to put most of the risk on the research participants, and the justification for that is not usually benefit to the participants, but benefit to society at large. The concept of justice in research ethics has to do with whether there is a disproportionate burden on some portion of the society to participate in research and some other portion of society to benefit from it. So we'll talk about all of these in the context of your research design. Now, protection from harm is the baseline concept. Research always involves some kind of risk. Sometimes that risk is called negligible risk. Negligible risk is when the research doesn't really involve any more risk than what someone would undertake anyway in the course of their normal everyday lives. So risk that might be involved in wasting a little bit of someone's time to take an anonymous questionnaire, or risk that might be involved in someone being observed doing something in a public space that's not of a particularly controversial nature. Those sorts of things might fall into a negligible risk category. Low risk involves some form of possible risk to participants, but not something that would seem to require major ethics oversight. In some countries, uh, low risk projects are not subject to review by ethics review boards or institutional review boards. In other countries, they are subject to review, or in some organizations, they will be subject to review. But the standards of the review are usually a little bit gentler. It's a little bit easier to explain the research design for a low risk project. And then there are projects that involve substantial risk. Now, risk in research can take a lot of different forms. Medical research, of course, we're familiar with thinking of it posing physical risks to participants. That's very high risk, and so that gets a very high level of scrutiny. Social research, which is what we're concerned with here, can pose physical risks, but it's rarer. Um, obviously, if it does, that puts it in a high risk category psychological risk, the risk that someone will be distressed by the situation that you put them in. Maybe you ask them a question that evokes a traumatic memory. Maybe you put them in an experimental situation that frightens them or alarms them in some way. Um, maybe you ask them to remember something that is unpleasant. There are psychological risks that can be involved in research. Legal risks. If you ask someone to talk to you about something that they've done where they've violated the law or where they've seen other people violate the law, you can expose them to a level of legal risk. Social or reputational risk. Uh, this can arise in otherwise quite seemingly safe forms of research. So, for example, someone is filling out an anonymous questionnaire. The researcher is not going to know who they are, but the questions are of a sensitive nature. What happens if someone wanders past when they're asking a question, uh, answering a question about their sexuality or their medical history or something they might not want other people to know? Reputational risk can sometimes arise if someone is seen talking to a researcher. Maybe they're involved in an organization where the organization doesn't want to be researched. So social and reputational risk can be quite a subtle thing and something that social researchers may have to uh, pay particular attention to. If it is possible in your research design, you need to eliminate a risk. So any risk that is not absolutely necessary for a participant or a researcher to go through shouldn't be part of your research design. You can't eliminate all risks. There's always something that's going to remain. Hopefully it's negligible or low risk, but there's a level of risk that is ineradicable from research design. 
So if you can't eliminate the risk, you need to minimize the risk as much as possible. You need to do due diligence, you need to think about safe options, you need to think about ways that you can help people if a risk materializes. If there is a physical risk, how are you going to help people? If someone becomes psychologically distressed, are you going to give them access to counseling? What are you going to do to minimize the risk of something going wrong and to help people if it does? All risks need to be offset by corresponding benefits. Now this is a tricky issue and we'll talk about this a little bit more because the risk is taken usually by a research participant but the benefits usually accrue to other people. So while in general the research needs to have enough benefit to justify asking somebody to take a risk, it's still an ethical quandary who has to take the risk versus who benefits from most kinds of research. Now informed consent is in part designed to deal with this dilemma that we were just discussing. So the problem is that research has a benefit, but that benefit flows to the public in general or to some broader set of people, but the risks disproportionately fall on the research participants. So how do you justify that imbalance? Well, one of the solutions to that problem, it's not the only consideration, but it is one of the considerations, is that you explain very, very clearly to the research participant what they're getting themselves into. If there's not going to be a benefit to them personally. You need to tell them that and make sure that they understand that they are not obligated to go through the research. So informed consent involves a clear explanation to all potential participants of what they're going to be asked to do. Does the research mean that they can answer an anonymous questionnaire? Does it mean that you're going to follow along as they go about their workday for the next eight hours? Does it mean you're going to observe something? Are you doing an experiment of some kind? How much of their time are you going to take and what exactly are you going to ask them to do? Any risks of the research of those physical, legal, psychological, social and reputational kinds that you can think of, you need to spell out for the participants. A risk might not occur to them because they're not experts in the research. It might seem completely harmless to them, but you know from your expertise and the research you've done on research itself uh, that there are some possible risks and you need to let them know what those are. Any benefits that they might receive personally as a participant, or more commonly uh, in social research, you may be telling them that there are no personal benefits. What kind of data you're going to collect about them or from them, and how that data is going to be used and how it's going to be stored. Often, this sort of bit of the research design is regulated by some sort of privacy or data management law or policy uh, in your country or your organization. Uh, and you'll need to familiarize yourself with that body of law or policy so that you're doing the right thing with the data. Sometimes those require that data be preserved for a particular period of time, that data be destroyed after a particular period of time, that it be stored in a particular way, and you're going to want to familiarize yourself uh, with those standards. Particularly important to informed consent is that you let participants know that they do not have to participate that even if they agree to participate, they can withdraw, assuming that withdrawal is a meaningful possibility for the kind of research you're doing, and that if they want to see at some later point the data that you've collected from them, and you're able to tell which data is theirs, there is a process they can go through to access their data. Some research projects, this will be impossible. Sometimes you'll collect data and you will immediately aggregate it with other people's data and you have no idea whose data is whose. In that case, if someone says, I want to see my data, you simply can't give it to them. But in many cases, if you're interviewing people or if you're coding data so that you can backtrack to whose data it is, uh, someone has the right um, to see what you've collected and they may have the right to withdraw their individual data uh, from your data set. Generally speaking, these are put into a standard form. Your university or other organization will probably have a consent form template that it prefers that you use. And that template will also include information like who they can contact if they have concerns or questions or complaints or they want to access their data. So you'll want to take a look for that template for your particular university or organization. Uh, also, Typically, there is some kind of signed consent form, although there are other ways for people to indicate consent other than signing on the dotted line. But this is 
in principle usually a relatively formalized process that involves the creation of some kind of participant information document that explains what's going on with the research in everyday language that participants can be expected to understand and then you get their explicit consent whether it's signed or indicated in some other agreed way. Consent is complicated. Uh, there are there's a nice sort of model of your rational actor participant who's fully conversant with academic research and knows exactly what's going on in a research environment and understands all the jargon and has no difficulty weighing up all the risks and all the benefits and making an informed decision. But in the real world, there are a lot of complications around how to make sure that people have the capacity meaningfully to consent to participate in the research and fully understand what's involved and what the risks are and fully understand their rights. Some of these are clearer than others. So if someone does not have the legal capacity to enter into a contract, maybe they're very young, um, that can complicate consent. On the other hand, the fact that someone's very young, which for other legal matters could mean that they have a guardian who's able to represent them and sign for them, that doesn't necessarily work in research. If you want to do research on young people and their parents are all for it, and the young person themselves says, I don't want to do this, it's very complicated. Um, it's not necessarily okay to take the consent of a guardian to apply to the consent of a minor. And there's a specialist literature on this that you can look at if it applies to your research. Dependence of the person who is participating in research on the researcher. And dependence is if someone is a student or an employee or has a family relationship or anything that creates a potential social pressure or financial pressure on someone to agree. It may in fact be the case that there won't be any negative consequences if they say no, but people can be afraid that there will be negative consequences. Uh, this arises fairly frequently for a lot of researchers who like to do research in their own classrooms. They may know that they're not going to punish someone with a low grade if they don't participate in their research project, but it can be very difficult to communicate that to a student who's rightfully quite afraid that they need to show some kind of goodwill um, and willing to participate in the professor's activities. Um, dependence happens in studying things in your own workplace, and certain forms of incentives, which I'll talk about more in a bit, can also be strong enough that they effectively create a dependence relationship cognitive capacity. So if someone has an impairment or a disability, again, this does not rule out their capacity to consent. And it's important to recognize that it doesn't because there can be a tendency to be patronizing about capacity to consent when someone has a disability. But there is a specialist literature and you should read it and make yourself familiar with processes for navigating consent when there might be uh, some situation that affects someone's capacity to fully understand what's going on in a standard contractual model of consent. Um, this can arise though where there's no disability or no obvious impairment, but where the way that you've tried to explain the research is so jargon filled and so specialized and so fancy uh, that someone of an ordinary level of education and intelligence just can't follow what you're saying. And so they may think they're agreeing to something different from what they're agreeing to. The participant information forms that I talked about in the previous slide are sometimes called plain language statements. And they're called plain language statements because of the fear that if they are not expressed plainly, clearly, simply, um, people can just be confused. Uh, it's a bit like you know reading the fine print on some kind of sales contract. You don't want to be the used car salesperson of research. You want to make sure that people understand uh, what they're signing on to. Vulnerability is a category that is quite broad and can express and capture people in a very different kinds of circumstances. So if someone is ill, if they're from a community that has historically had a problematic relationship to the research community, where the research community might have been abusive of its power over the community. Um, anything that might make someone particularly fragile during the process of participating in the research is something that needs to be thought about uh, with reference to whether you're getting meaningful consent and whether someone understands that they can decline or they can withdraw.
incentives for research. Uh, in Australia, incentives are quite rare. In other countries, they are more common. But if you are giving somebody money in exchange for the time they're spending in research, if you are doing something for them or giving them access to something or providing resources to them, you have to think about whether the incentive you're providing is such that it might override someone's better judgment about whether they really should participate in the research. So it goes together with some of these other questions about capacity to consent. Uh, if someone really needs money and your research project is offering a lot of it, uh, they may do it against their better judgment. So incentives can become an issue for consent. Misunderstandings and miscommunications are something that often are not thought about, but the idea that research is something that might be quite normal to a professional who does it all the time, but research is actually quite weird for most people who participate in it, and there's a tendency to reinterpret interactions that people have with researchers in more familiar terms, as though you're a friend or a colleague or a doctor or something else. Uh, and so people may misunderstand even relatively clear documents by interpreting it in the light of other things that are more familiar to their experience. And communicating with people enough in the process of gaining consent that you can unearth any possible misunderstandings uh, can help things go smoothly. Now, transparency uh, is something that's come up already in this lecture. The idea that you need to speak plainly is part of it, so people need to actually be able to understand what you're saying, uh, otherwise you're not being particularly transparent. But transparency is more complicated than just whether your language is too difficult. Uh, some kinds of research involve observations of people who don't know they're being researched. So for example, you might be watching activities in a public space. It's very difficult to be transparent that you're doing research in that context. It's not necessarily problematic or wrong to do it, but again, there's a literature that you should backtrack to and read on what it's okay to do and what it's not okay to do when you're watching things people are doing publicly. Uh, the classic example of something that's not okay to do is it's not okay for the researcher to stand in the public square with a telephoto lens taking pictures of the inside of someone else's bedroom. Okay, that's you're in the public space as the researcher, but they are doing something private and they have an expectation of privacy. Uh, it might be okay to watch a public meeting in a public square and listen to things that people are trying to say to the crowd. It's probably a little bit less okay to sidle up to a public telephone, if those still exist, um, and eavesdrop on the conversations people are having. They have an expectation of privacy, even though they seem to be in a public space. So thinking about what it means to gain consent um, when not all possible par participants may be aware that you're doing research, this also arises in some forms of ethnographic research, where the people who consent to you being there may be gatekeepers or stakeholders for a particular community. If you're doing ethnographic research in a corporation, you probably have negotiated with someone from on high who has allowed you access to that community. If you're doing ethnographic observation, in a small town, you might have negotiated access uh, from various respected figures in that community, but that's not the same thing as getting individual consent from every single person that you might come across in the process of doing that research. Again, there's nothing wrong with this. It does not necessarily violate ethics to do this kind of research, but it does complicate the issue of what it means to have consent to be doing the research process, and you should read in that area if your research involves that kind of situation. Honesty is an interesting one. In general, if you're going to ask people to consent to research, you're meant to tell them what's going on. How can they assess the risks if they don't know what they're actually having to do? But there's quite a lot of research that's actually not possible to do if people understand what it's for. So if you're trying to figure out what people do when they're not being observed, if you're trying to test how honest people are, uh, if you're trying to do any number of things where people's behavior might change if they knew that's the behavior you were watching, you can't really brief them in advance. Uh, so duplicitous research, it's often called, uh, is a category. And again, duplicitous research is not 
banned, it's not something that you can never do, but it's something that takes some very careful consideration uh, because it is harder to justify. You are asking people to take risks that they do not know they're taking. And so generally it needs some very careful attention to the benefits of the research and to whether duplicity is really, really required. Um, and also the risks that you're asking participants to take on. Some people worry about literacy with reference to informed consent because the most common way of getting consent from people is to hand them a piece of paper that says what the research is about and then to ask them to sign a form saying they've understood all that and they're fine with it. And obviously depending on someone's uh, language skills, uh, their fluency in the particular language the research has been conducted in, whether they can read at all, um, you that may not be a good way of getting consent. But you don't have to ask for consent by giving somebody a piece of paper and asking them to sign something you can have a conversation with people, you can record their response. There are various ways for people to, to indicate their consent that are not the traditional read a piece of paper and sign it kind of model. Consenting for others uh, is a tricky thing and it arises in situations where there might be some kind of guardian in charge of someone, or sometimes it arises for situations where you've got communities where particular gatekeepers uh, are the ones that you need to contact first about access to that community. Consenting for others is okay in some circumstances, and in other circumstances it would be taken to violate the principle of informed consent, and again, it's something that you should read more on if it might apply to your research. All of these are things that are relatively known. They are things that are somewhat predictable. You can probably get a feel for whether they would apply to your project. You can probably try to warn yourself in advance and prepare for them by doing some reading about other researchers who've been in the same situation. But sometimes things you didn't anticipate affect consent. Uh, the best solution to this is both to read as much as you can in advance and then to be prepared in the field and to reconsider, if necessary, whether you actually really did have consent to gather certain data and have permission to use it. Sometimes you have to renegotiate and rethink what you thought the premises of your research were on the fly. Control over personal information. Now this is traditionally phrased as privacy, right to privacy, and your research participants certainly do have a right to privacy, but personal information and control over personal information is broader than just privacy. Uh, some participants don't want that privacy. Uh, sometimes it's impossible to offer it. So I think it's better to think about this as how much control you can provide your participants over their personal information and as much as you can to give them the ability to determine how their information can be used for research purposes. So often people discuss this in terms of the concepts of anonymity and confidentiality. It is also common to misuse these terms. It's important to distinguish them, uh, and in particular to know for yourself whether your research offers anonymity or whether the best you can do is confidentiality. So to clarify what the terms mean, anonymity means that no one, including you as the researcher, is able to identify the research participant. So you've put up an online survey and and random people on the net have filled it out and all you have are their responses, you've not tracked their IP addresses, you've got no way to figure out who they are. Or something similar on a street corner, you're standing there and you're passing out questionnaires as people go past and they fill them out or they don't and they stick them in a box and you have no idea who they are. That's anonymous and there are other variations of anonymous, but anonymous means that you would have no way of tracking someone's data back to the person who provided that data. Confidentiality means that the researcher is able to identify the participant, maybe because they interviewed them in person, maybe because they've coded forms that people filled out such that they can link them to an individual person, sometimes because the nature of the data that's been collected is intrinsically uniquely identifying. When this is the case, the researcher can commit not to identify participants publicly. So in any research or conversations in public that happen about the research, the researcher makes a commitment to keep the identity of the person confidential, even though that person is not anonymous to the researcher. Uh, 
anonymity and confidentiality are normally understood as harm minimization strategies. So one of the risks from research is that you reveal something that is potentially damaging. Um, maybe it's a sensitive piece of information about your health or your religious beliefs or your sexuality. And if that information comes to be attached to your name or your address or something uniquely identifying about you, all of a sudden that information has gotten out of your control. So if you are anonymous or if the researcher keeps your identity confidential, it minimizes the risk of that harm. There's also an intersection here with privacy law and with the notion that people have the right to view data that's collected and kept about them by various organizations. Researchers are generally working for a larger organization that is subject to some kind of privacy law. And again, where the researcher has the ability to figure out which data came from which person, that person has the right to come back to the researcher and say, I want to see what you have on me. And sometimes they'll take a look at what you have on them and they won't be happy about it. And they'll say, I withdraw now, give me my data back. And they have the right or should have the right to do that. If they are anonymous, you don't know, you can't reconnect their data to them. Or if you have anonymized their data, maybe you know they were a research participant, but as soon as they gave you their data, you immediately aggregated it with other people's data and you have no idea whose is what. Um, and they come and they say, I want to see my personal data, you may just not be able to meet that request. And that's okay. Um, but they should be warned in advance which of those scenarios is likely to apply. It is not always realistic to offer either anonymity or confidentiality. So some data is intrinsically identifying. If you are making an audio recording, taking a video, taking a photo, some other kinds of things might also be intrinsically identifying. If that is the case, you cannot claim to be offering anonymity, even if you as the researcher wouldn't be able to take the audio or the video and tell anyone who that person is. Somebody could, somebody who knows them would be able to recognize them. So they're not really anonymous. Some kinds of social research require the researchers to know participants as well, sometimes just as a code, so that they can link, for example, data that's collected at different moments in time if they're tracking how a particular individual may change based on certain life stages or something like that, or they need to link a person to various other bits of information demographically or in terms of where they live. So anonymity is often not possible to offer, and it's important to be clear that you're not able to offer it uh, if you can't. Confidentiality is more difficult uh, than you might think. Um, it requires a good data management strategy. So someone is not terribly confidential if you interview them and then you write their name and full address uh, on the uh, you know top of the document that you make their interview transcription on. Uh, people use codes, they use other kinds of strategies to make it a little harder to reconstruct the identity of people from their data. Uh, you need strong data security and there will generally be data security policies and there may be relevant laws around data security that you need to know. Uh, it's not okay to promise confidentiality and then make it really, really easy for anyone who works in your organization to sort of idly flip through the records of the people who participated in your research. Confidentiality is a strong promise and you need to take it seriously. In some places, for example, if you're doing work in a small community or a small enough organization, it is intrinsically going to be possible for other people in that community or that organization, or just possible for the individual themselves to figure out who is being discussed in the research. So confidentiality may be bounded by the fact that you're not collecting enough data to meaningfully disguise who participants are. It may be that they're the only ones who could recognize themselves, but it may be that quite a few people who know them pretty well could take a pretty good stab at recognizing them. And again, you need to level with people about that. It's a possible risk, and if they're concerned about it, they may not want to participate in the research. The other thing to recognize is that you can be legally compelled or legally obligated to identify participants if you can. 
you are not their priest, you are not their doctor. There are not generally legal protections that exempt researchers from having to hand over data if there is a legal process that requests the data. So you need to be aware that that is the case. If you have research where you think it is a particular concern that there might be legal requests for the data, again, there's a specialist literature on that and there are particular strategies that you may want to consider. The other thing, though, to mention that gets overlooked in the emphasis on anonymity and confidentiality is that for some kinds of research, particularly qualitative research where you're spending a lot of time in communities doing in-depth interviews or ethnographic or participant observations uh, or some kinds of action research, perhaps, some participants want their identities known. They have gifted the research with their story and they want to claim it. They want it known that this is their story. And in this circumstance, it can be unethical to conceal who they are. At the same time, sometimes in this circumstance, someone wants their name attached to data and yet you know that if their name is published with that data, it will involve certain kinds of harm that they might not be anticipating. So again, these are discussions you have to have and sometimes they're complicated decisions to make. Now justice is a somewhat more abstract or almost philosophical issue. It is not something that you'll hear a lot about when thinking about an individual project going before an individual ethics review board, but it is something that matters in terms of thinking about the ethics of research as a collective activity. So we've said that when you assess the value of a research proposal, you're weighing risks and benefits, and that a dilemma arises because risks are accruing mainly to individual participants and benefits are accruing mainly to other people. But sometimes there's an unequal distribution of risks and benefits through society. And this can matter for the ethicalness of research as a collective whole. So is some portion of society unusually burdened by being the subject of research. Vulnerable populations historically have often been the subject of research disproportionately to any benefit that they would receive from it and disproportionately to their ability meaningfully to consent or refuse to consent. Um, does some portion of society unusually benefit? So are we doing a lot of research that is not necessarily applicable to society as a whole, but that is overwhelmingly something that benefits a segment of society. You may be familiar with discussions about medical research where for reasons, some of which are kind of sound in many ways, a lot of research is done on men and therefore can only be extrapolated to men. A lot of research is done on people uh, who are from specific races and therefore can't necessarily be extrapolated for people from other races. Uh, so these are the sorts of things. Is there something going on about the structure of recruitment of research participants, about the kinds of questions we're asking that skews things? And there are some examples of this that uh, have been in the news relatively recently. There's a lovely paper, I've included the link to it in the comments on these slides, um, that's often referred to as the weird people paper. It's the, the weirdest people in the world uh, that talks about psychological research and the fact that disproportionately the subjects for psychological research are actually undergraduate students in Western universities. And these students are not normal, even though research on those students is used to extrapolate what are purportedly universal findings about human psychology. And there's a lovely little article that argues that these people are weird. They are not normal. They are weird. They are Western. They are educated. They are industrialized. They are rich. They are democratic democratic more so than the population of the world. Uh, so maybe there's something weird in how we extrapolate from that data. Maybe the risks and benefits of research are not being distributed equitably. In this case, because both the participants and the likely beneficiaries of the research are coming from a very select global population. Uh, there's debate over this article as well, with some people arguing that, um, you know, the case for this isn't as strong as this article asserts. You can read that literature if you're curious. Um, there's debate over research that is done that is then monetized by private organizations or states, uh, research that collects from the cultural inheritance or genetic information of historically colonized peoples, for example. So you have a disproportionate mobilization of research resources that collect 
information that is valuable for humanity as a whole in some sense, but where the most direct beneficiaries of that information are private companies or colonial states uh, or generally entities that are not the people who provided that information, that data, that those samples, um, some of whom may also not have been given a meaningful ability to consent. Race, class, and gender differences in participation and beneficiaries. Now again, for social research you may have a question that justifies specifically recruiting people who are from some particular class fraction or a particular gender or whatever, but if that justification does not affect your research, if it does not drive your research substantively, uh, you want to think about whether the way you're recruiting people is skewing something in a way that you're not intending it to be skewed. Okay, So these sorts of concepts, although they may not be something you can fully action at the level of an individual research project, are important concepts. Now if you are doing sufficiently high risk social research, you will be asked to go through a process of formal ethics review by your university and by many other organizations as well. Uh, these boards are sometimes called institutional review boards or IRBs, so if you're doing a literature search in this, you might find that you're getting more literature under institutional review board than under something like ethics committees. But these are bodies that are formally convened and they are responsible for evaluating research designs to weigh the risks and benefits. They're often criticized, they often have a bit of a bad rap for their insufficient understanding of social research and it can be the case that there's a kind of a, an imagination of medical research lying in the background of the forms that these committees use and the way that they think researchers should provide information on research designs. So in some cases, in some institutions, social researchers can have a bit of a hard time explaining what they're doing to ethics committees. In general though, some of that hard time comes from researchers themselves being overly literal about the forms these kinds of committees can provide. So ethics application forms often sound like only a certain kind of research would be acceptable, but the form is just normed on what the most standard forms of research are, and you can in fact address and make the case for a wider variety of research than the form would imply by itself. So ethics application forms can sometimes make it sound as though the entire research design has to be spelled out in advance right now. And this poses a particular problem for more exploratory forms of research. So if you're planning to do an ethnographic project and you are committed to doing a collaborative research design with the people that you're working with, you're just not going to be able to spell out that design in advance. That's going to be more okay than you think it is. You need to explain why your collaborative process meets a certain kind of ethical standard and may for your particular research meet that standard better than if you were to sit back as a researcher and just tell the community what you were going to do. Um, so you need to do a bit more work to explain what you're doing, but you can explain that your, that your method matches the principles that are meant to be achieved by a formal ethics review even if it does not do it in the same way that a sort of a medical research project might be able to do. The forms can also sound as though consent always takes the form of written signed contracts and you may be working with populations where that is not an appropriate way to seek consent. Again, you just need to explain that as part of the process. You need to work on the literature that explains alternatives for the kind of population you'll be working with and you need to explain the nature of how you're still going to achieve consent. Um, or if you're doing a project that requires deceit, if you're doing a duplicitous research project, uh, you need to talk about how that project is justified in spite of the fact that it seems to contravene the principle of informed consent. Ethics application forms can sometimes also sound as though your data is always collected in a fully structured and pre-planned form. So for example, a lot of social researchers have a set of things that they want to find out, but they don't necessarily find those out through an interview schedule which has specific questions where they will ask the exact same question in the exact same way, in the exact same order for every participant, but often forms will ask you to attach your interview schedule or whatever the equivalent would be for your research. If you need something semi-structured or unstructured, again, you explain that rather than attaching your interview schedule. You don't need to feel compelled to conform 
to the lines on the form. You can amend them, you can add to them, you can talk about what your research needs instead, and the literature is your friend here. You can cite the literature in order to demonstrate that your technique is best practice for your field. So you want to focus on the risk-benefit issues that apply to your specific research, and you want to show how your research is compatible with the overarching principles that guide ethics. The reality is that although people worry a lot and complain a lot about IRBs and formal ethics reviews, the formal ethics review is really the easy part. Um, it is a safety net. It is there to help you catch obvious and glaring errors in your research design so that you don't make the kinds of mistakes that all sorts of researchers have made before you uh, and so that you don't put participants and yourself through unnecessary risk. It's a process that's best for identifying the sorts of problems that have cropped up before and that are predictable for particular kinds of research. But most social researchers find that when they get into the trenches of doing their project, there will be specific ethical issues that just kind of fall between the cracks of the formal review process. They're harder to anticipate in advance. So you're going to want a steady process of reflecting on unexpected events in your project. You're want, going to want to consult your supervisor or other experienced researchers. Before you go into the field and before you finalize your research design, you're going to want to read widely in your discipline and about your method. You're going to want to do specific literature searches on ethics in relation to key terms in your project. So don't just read literature on what other people know about your researching. Read literature that is specific to ethics in relation to your topics and ethics in relation to your method so that you maximize the chances that even if your exact situation hasn't come up before, something sort of like it has and it sort of gives you an idea about how you should respond. The other thing I want to say about the formal process is that you can meet every single requirement of the formal process and you can still not satisfy your ethical obligations. There can be something that emerges in the field or something that emerges at the level of design that really is not meeting the spirit of what the formal ethics process is about, but is not revealed by the formal process. So at every stage of your project, you need to realize that you're actually bound by the principle of being ethical. The formal ethics review is just one of the various safety nets that tries to make sure that you're abiding by that principle, but you have a higher standard that you're obligated to than just can you get past the IRB. Uh, at every stage, you need to think about whether you're doing right, whether you're doing right by your participants, your colleagues, and society in general. Okay? Research is a public responsibility. Now, speaking of research as a public responsibility, publishing is actually part of it and is part of what justifies research on an ethical level. A lot of people don't think about publishing that way. They think of publishing as something that academics do for their career or that researchers do to influence policy or whatever else. But publishing is actually part of the ethical contract that you enter into for your participants. So you've asked participants to accept a personal risk and you've told them that they're doing that because it will be for the greater good in some sense. But if all you do is collect their information and do some analyses and get a degree and then shove your thesis in a drawer and no one ever sees it, nobody benefits, except maybe you. But the research would never have been approved if you'd come up and said, you know, I want all of these people to take however minimal a risk and I'm the only one who's going to benefit from that. Okay, So implicit in the contract of research is that you're not just doing this for yourself, you're not just doing it to satisfy your personal curiosity, you're doing it to extend the boundaries of human knowledge. And for that reason, you get some latitude about imposing on other people, particularly if they're willing to be imposed on. Publication is part of your side of the bargain. So even unsuccessful research is worth publishing in some fashion if only to help other researchers avoid the same mistakes. Uh, null results are not a mistake, but people often act like they are. A null result is you've started out, you have a hypothesis, you are doing research to test the hypothesis, and you get your results back, and the results say, no, nope, hypothesis was wrong. Uh, so uh, that's a result. It's worth knowing. And there are systematic problems in research, and you can do some reading on this, about the fact that people tend to not publish null results. Journals tend to not want them. Uh, and so it can make people actually 
feel like no results aren't being generated. Uh, it's called a file drawer problem. Uh, it's a good idea to try to get null results in the world somewhere, even if a journal won't take them. Uh, getting them out there through a research archive of some type uh, is helpful to other researchers and can help provide a context for understanding the projects that seem to generate wildly positive results. Uh, if people know that there are null results floating around out there, they can, they can kind of balance those out. Uh, research that fails or whose method needs to be radically revised partway tr through, there's a tendency to sort of hide that this happens, that, you know, to sort of retrospectively write the research as though what you ended up doing in the end was what you started doing. And this causes a couple of problems uh, for novice researchers. It disguises the nature of research itself. Uh, for other researchers, it hides possible problems with method and possible solutions to those problems. Obviously, if you need to radically revise your method and you've obtained ethics approval formally for an earlier version of the method, you also need to revisit that approval and make sure you don't need to amend or file a new ethics application for whatever your new research model is. But regardless, putting into the public sphere what actually happens uh, within the limits of what you need to do to protect your participants uh, is an important part of your side of the bargain. Um, not all publishers are ethical. Uh, and this is something that can be particularly hard to navigate for people who are just starting out in research. So one of the things that you'll need to do, and we'll have some other lectures on this later, are looking into things like predatory publishing and the reputation of the press or the journal before you agree to publish with them. Certain kinds of publishing can actually have the ethical effect of lending credibility to places that will in fact put anything into print no matter how big a nonsense it is. Uh, so you want to make sure that your careful, well-designed, sound research is not being used to increase the credibility of something that is in fact sort of undermining the quality of research in general. And you want to follow ethical standards in your own writing, so not just your research design, not just how you interact with participants, uh, but you want to be ethical about how you treat authorship Okay, so how you're dealing with other people who might have made contributions to your written work and acknowledging that. Uh, how you deal with originality. So people think of this in terms of plagiarism. Uh, you're going to want to familiarize yourself with standards around citation and note taking. People get themselves into terrible trouble by not having strong note taking practices. Transparency about what you've done and honesty in the reporting of research. Uh, sometimes research generates things that we wish it hadn't. Uh, part of our particular obligation, part of what makes us honest and ethical researchers is that we deal with that, we roll with that, uh, we analyze it and we report it. Um, so that's all part of ethics in research. There are other dimensions of ethics in addition to the things that we've been considering. So in particular professions, there may be professional ethical standards that will change how you're expected to deal with certain kinds of scenarios. Some professions, for various reasons, are not allowed to do things that other professions would not have trouble doing uh, because of the status or the social influence or the skill of that particular profession. There are political dimensions to social research many of which also uncover aspects of ethics. And again, I'll treat this in more detail in other lectures, but you're going to want to think about possible broader impacts of your research and possible political implications of your research. Not that this changes whether you would publish or what you would do with the material, but it helps you be more aware of the likely impact that your research is going to have. So that's just a quick overview of basics of research ethics. And you will want to look in more detail at the specific processes of your ethics committee. And you're also going to want to do a lot of specific reading around your topic and your research method to get a better sense of the on the ground detail ethical issues you may need to deal with.